Hi, everyone. It's funny, I don't get nervous talking before 2,000 people or before elected officials. I get nervous talking in front of rabbis. That's because I respect all of you so much, I guess, and I feel really judged. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, my topic is on homelessness. For those of you who don't know, I've been very involved with this issue. I've decided instead of doing the kiss across the Gemara, I'm doing the EU on one issue, sort of how our synagogue is approach social justice. And um, so uh, I can go over all of the qualifications and things, but what's most important, I think about um, Psalm 27, Psalm 4, the days of Elul, Achal Sha'alti Meit Adonai, Ota Vakesh, Shifti Beveit Adonai, Koyam Echaim. The center of the psalm is the, the writer, the psalmist, is surrounded by darkness and sadness and trauma. And all this person wants to do is go home. And that's what we're going to talk about. In my session, I have a lot of data and a lot of statistics because I'm very involved with this issue. So you have the right story to tell. And we have a number of textual bases. And, um, and so we'll look at some of those. And then I want to open a discussion about what you can do as a leader, what you can do as an institution what you can do that won't get you in trouble with your congregation, and what you can do that might get you in trouble, but might be worth it. And, uh, and also then talk about a larger project that I'm working on about compiling uh, Jewish technical sources on homelessness and stuff. So I uh, hope you join me for that. I mean, there's so many, one, I think I'm the last one, so I'll just no, say, not. I'm not the last one. So close. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, every single choice here is a great choice, and if you choose to be with me, I'd be honored. Hi everyone, thanks for uh, being with me and, uh, and coming to this session. So uh, a little bit about me, uh, I work at Valley Beth Shalom, but I was also a um, community organizer by training, and uh, I brought those skills into my rabbinate in all sorts of different ways, and around homelessness, it became a really uh, powerful skill set that has helped me mobilize my community and, in fact, helped mobilize a massive amount of Angelinos through a huge coalition that I coach in. So I want to talk a little bit about that by leaning in with a story first because I believe in storytelling. This is the corner of Ventura Boulevard and the 405 Freeway. I used to live in Sherman Oaks, which is on the other side of that freeway, uh, and the synagogue is in Encino. And so I used to live on one side of the freeway and have to walk under the freeway to get to synagogue in the morning. And on that embankment was a man who uh, I called Jack, um, who I got to know over the course of several weeks in the summer. And we got to know each other. He became part of who, uh, sort of my morning Shabbat walk. I would bring him food from Kiddush at Shul. And then one August afternoon, about five years ago, uh, I was walking home at this corner and Jack was sitting in a squad car, and behind him was a sanitation truck, and he had been arrested, and they were throwing away all of his stuff. And I don't know what happened to him. I asked the police why he was arrested. Apparently, he got too close to the hotel, which was just on the other side of the street, and the manager of the hotel was looking for an excuse to get rid of this homeless person, and so they had him arrested. So that was five years ago, and I began a process then of mobilizing my congregation on Rosh Hashanah of that year, so just about a month later. And through that entire year, we, uh, we mobilized and we actually created, beyond the synagogue, the largest housing coalition in L.A. County history. And in the last five years has moved $5 billion in funding for affordable housing and homeless services. And uh, that's because this issue is so important. It's not a political issue, in my opinion, although it involves politics. It's not an economic issue, although it involves economics. It is, at its heart, a moral issue. Our tradition teaches, as all of you know, that when God decided to create human <coughs> beings, God decided to create each and every one of us in God's image. Which means that every single human being that exists is imprinted with the stamp of God. And when someone is absolutely vulnerable, 
thrown to the street like trash and forgotten as if they're part of the background of the environment instead of the foreground. That blindness we have to those human beings is a mark on, on God. And so for me, homelessness is, is the, one of the, great, the deepest and uh, difficult moral issues of our time. And uh, we don't need to get into a conversation of is it more moral than the immigration conversation or a gun violence conversation. But the truth is, is if you don't have a place to sleep at night, and you don't have a place to feel safe and secure, and you don't have a place where you can put your stuff, and you don't have a place, you know, if you go to sleep at night and you're afraid you're going to be robbed or raped or murdered or victimized, and you're sleeping on the concrete, on the street. You're one of the most vulnerable people in our society. And uh, our congregation, myself included, have taken on this issue. So what I want to do, though, is start with some good news. As much as there's bad news, I want to start with some good news. When we think about the homeless, this is what we normally think. These individuals, these, these are all pictures of the Los Angeles. This is what we think of. They're predominantly, the, the image of the homeless that we have are predominantly men, predominantly people of color, predominantly uh, somehow injured or strange or drunk or addicted. That's the image that we actually, that's the image that we have in our mind when we think of a homeless person. But the truth is we know that they only make up, this group <coughs> looks like this, make up only about a third of the entire homeless population. There are more families that are homeless and elderly people that are homeless than single men as a percentage of the population. And so one of the things we have to do is dispel the myth of what we know, what we be when we say homeless. There are four big inroads to homelessness. The first is poverty. The second is housing. The third is trauma. And the fourth is mental health, which I count that separate from other types of trauma. Well, of right. So poverty, poverty is, so let me go through each one of those. Poverty, what I mean by poverty is I mean the lack of wages or the cost of living or uh, the lack of privilege. Privilege, I define privilege in a very particular way. Privilege is the distance between you or me and utter suffering. The more you have a distance between you and utter suffering, the more privilege you have. And it's really important to think about privilege that way because the folks who are homeless have the least amount of privilege. Most people who become homeless are homeless for less than one year. And most of them become homeless because they don't have a network of individuals or families around them that can support them. And that's why poverty is such a big part of this, is because people who are extremely poor have thin networks. In fact, it's been proven that thick social networks create wealth. That's mom and dad giving you money for a house. Mom and dad paying for your education or your uncle taking you on vacation, or having someone pick you up from school, or pick your kids up from school. That's all privilege, because that's all distancing you from utter suffering. Thick social familial networks create resiliency in families that move them off the bottom of the, of the wealth scale. The second is housing, and that is probably the biggest inroad into homelessness. Los Angeles County has a 2% vacancy rate, which means only 2% of all of the available beds in Los Angeles County tonight will be empty. Which means that if you decide to leave your apartment, your landlord already has four or five applications in the drawer waiting for your apartment. So when you have a small amount of su supply and a large amount of demand, right, that is, that drives prices up. And most people who are become homeless, it's because of housing. The third category is trauma. And what do we mean by trauma? Trauma is domestic violence. Trauma is war. 
Trauma is coming out to your parents and having them reject you. Trauma is the experience of being undercut in your mind and your body and your spirit and being something being taken away from you. And every single person who is homeless has been traumatized. Because becoming homeless is itself trauma. And so that means that if someone, for example, is fleeing a boyfriend or a girlfriend that is abusing them, then they become homeless, they are actually twice traumatized. They're traumatized because of the abuse, and they're traumatized because they don't have a secure place to live. And the fourth is mental health. We need a serious mental health conversation in this country because the largest mental health facility in the United States is Men's County Jail downtown with 3,000 mental health beds. Which means that if you don't have privilege, if you don't have privilege and you are mentally uh, sick, if you have mental health disability, you only have two options. Or maybe three. You can either go to the last remaining family members who maybe can take care of you, maybe not. Or you can go to jail because you've committed some kind of petty crime, but at least in jail you're being taken care of. Or you end up on the street. Those are the four biggest inroads to homelessness. The group you see here only represents a very small sliver. They're the most visible because they're the ones you see. They're the ones you see on the side of the freeway. They're the ones you see under the freeway. They're the ones you see um, in the front parts of Skid Row because they are, in fact, the most vulnerable in so many ways. And they have absolutely no room. So we're going to talk about numbers and such just so you have this material under your belt so when someone in your congregation or in your hospital or in your school asks you questions about, well, how many homeless are there? You have, you have something to say. So I have to download some info to you. So this is what we know. This is the good news. I've come as a preacher to preach you the good news. The good news is that for the first time in four years, homelessness dropped in Los Angeles by 4%. But that's not... I'll, by the way, I'll send you the whole deck so you don't have to take pictures. Um, there are 52,765 homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles. And somehow that's good news because it's down from 53,000 and change last year. All right, a small drop. Do you understand how many people that is? Do you know how many people fit in Poly Pavilion on a sold-out night? 20,000. Right. How many people fit in Dodger Stadium on a sold-out night? 60,000. Right. So imagine every night Dodger Stadium being totally full of homeless people. That's how many homeless people are in Los Angeles County on every given night. What makes Los Angeles one of the capitals of homelessness, though, is our unsheltered rate. Unsheltered means that they have no place to go. New York City has the largest homeless population in the, in the country at around 62,000, but their shelter rate is around 85%. Los Angeles has 53,700 and change, and our shelter rate is only about a third of the entire population. About 30%. Which makes us the homelessness capital of the United States. This is the, uh, the numbers for the city and for the county. So you'll have a chance to look at those. The city of Los Angeles, South, 31,285. 52,765 in LA County. And again, I'll show you, I'll be happy to email you the information. Okay? Um, this is one, as I said about housing, I want to focus on housing for a moment. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, exactly right. Yeah, city versus county. There are, so there are 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles. If you don't know the borders, I'll tell you the borders. The very northern border is the Los Angeles forest. So San Dimas and San, uh, right up to almost the border of San Bernardino on the east. The ocean in the west, all the way north to the north edge of Malibu, where it touches Ventura County. 
in the south, all the way down to Long Beach, so the port of Los Angeles, its sister port Long Beach is technically in the next county over. And then the east again, to all the way to San Bernardino. It's actually the largest, one of the largest counties in the United States. It is the largest, most populous county in the United States. And has 88 independent cities inside LA County. And an annual budget of over $28 billion. The city of Los Angeles is just one city. Of those, they're obviously the largest and most densely populated, and that's why it has the, the largest number of homeless people. Okay? Okay. Um, so, in order to fix the housing crisis, again, these are just straight numbers, and we'll get into the meaning of Torah in a minute, you need over 565,000 units of affordable housing. 565,000 units are needed to alleviate the housing pressure which creates homelessness. So um, that's important to know because when you think of homelessness itself, people experiencing homelessness, let's use a medical metaphor, okay? Homelessness, people experiencing homelessness, if the, the society of, of the Los Angeles was a, uh, a human being that is sick, the people who are experiencing homelessness is like our fever. It is a symptom of our disease. It is not the disease itself. People who experience homelessness, who are homeless, are a symptom of the moral disease that infects our community. In the beginning of the 20th century, when the United States was plagued by polio, we had a choice to make. We could either keep building more wheelchair factories for people to get wheelchairs because they had polio, or we could try to find a vaccine that's going to prevent people from getting polio. We invested heavily, we figured out how to solve the polio crisis, and we virtually eliminated polio from our society. And I think the same needs to be true for this situation. We could just build more shelters, which we need to do, but what we need to do is build housing to address the disease itself, and we need to fix wages so we address the disease itself, and not just symptoms of the disease. I'm a little confused yeah. by the discrepancy between five, 500,065 and 53. Is that because unit is, if they're, the number is so much bigger than the number of homeless? So is, right. is that because you know Yeah, you so this is what I want to say. This is, thank you for that. When you think of someone who's homeless, you have to realize that the person who's homeless today is probably not the person who's going to be homeless seven months from now. It's a rotating group of people. There's very few that are, that are permanently homeless. Those are called chronically homeless. Chronically homeless is defined as folks who are homeless for a year or longer and have a secondary debilitating condition like mental health or addiction. Those are the folks that are the hardest to treat and the most expensive to treat. They use 75% of the social safety net funds in LA County. And they only represent 25% of the people who are eligible for those funds. So that's for, the, for those of you who are concerned about the more business-oriented folks in your community, the H and HHH and working with United Way and the other parts of our coalition have figured out it's cheaper to build them a home than it is to allow them to be on the street because they will no longer be utilizing emergency services like ambulances and ERs, and they won't be utilizing emergency services like LAPD costs tens of thousands of dollars to keep someone in a hospital for 72 hours, let them out, and a week later have them back in the hospital. It's much cheaper to put them in a home, which is why we have this concept called housing first, which means build them a home. But that didn't really explain. So my point is, is that, sorry, my point is that, that uh, the folks who are in more of that rotating list is because they are so impoverished and they have so little privilege that they don't have a network to rely on. And so if we create 565,000 new units of affordable housing, that creates the buffer for an entire group of people that are not yet homeless, that will become oh. homeless. 
And so yeah. when you think of the homeless, don't just think of this one yeah. number. No, it, 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 the people are on the edge. Yeah. Yeah, off the edge. That's right. Yeah. And that's what we have to do. We, we right. can't, right. we have right. to go upstream. We can't okay. just deal yeah. with the symptoms. We have to right. do so here, just an example, since 2000, the median income in Los Angeles has increased 32%, while the median rental household's income has, has decreased 3%. You understand? There's the wage problem, the wage gap. There. And lastly, uh, LA County has the highest poverty rate across all counties in the state at nearly 25% of people who live in Los Angeles have or live under the poverty line. Which we know that you would compound that with cost of living, this is the federal poverty line. You compound that with a cost of living. The federal poverty line barely even cuts it in, in California, let alone in Los Angeles. Okay. So uh, three out of four people in Los Angeles remain unsheltered. Okay. 33,396. 75% of LA County is un unsheltered. Um, and only 25% is sheltered. Okay. And that, uh, the vehicles tend to makeshift shelters, not homes, right? Increased 5%, and last year alone, 32% since 2016. Again, I'll give you all of these stats. I just want you to see why we have such a big crisis. Okay. There you go. Okay, this is a little more wonky. This is if you're interested in race, ethnicity, gender, and age. So if you look very clear, clearly, you see that uh, African Americans and Latinos make up the vast majority. Caucasians make up the mixed group, and then other groups fall underneath it. And then if you look at um, the uh, the other two graphs, it's just again, it's just straight numbers. Most people who are homeless is another myth. Most people who are homeless come from the communities where they used to live. There's this wonderful myth that we, because we have sunshine, we don't have a lot of rain, and we have beaches, and we're pretty liberal, that people who are homeless come here to be homeless. Like they come from out of state, or they get, you know, take a train, or what have you. The truth is the vast majority of people are homeless in the communities where, where they used to live. I'll just tell a brief story. There's a woman that I had befriended in this work who used to be married to a man, and they had three kids. And they were not well off, but they made it work. And she used to go to the dry cleaners to uh, bring her husband's laundry to the dry cleaners, um, you know, once a week or what have you. It turns out, though, that their relationship was really broken, and that he began beating her. And eventually she just couldn't take it anymore, and one night she fled. She didn't flee with a plan, and she doesn't have extended family, so she's in the van with her kids. And she ends up in the parking lot of the dry cleaners. And the dry cleaner said, you can park and sleep in my parking lot. We're dry cleaners, you know, we're open very early in the morning. The kids can come in and use the bathroom. And so that's where she lives. She lives in the van with her kids. The dry cleaner lets her use the bathroom, get the kids washed up. Sometimes he brings a little food for them. But she doesn't want to leave the neighborhood because the kids are in school. The kids are enrolled in LAUSD, and we know a contiguous educational environment is the best opportunity for a child to succeed. So she doesn't want to leave. She doesn't want to go to a shelter that's far away. She doesn't want to uh, be outed as someone who's homeless. So they sleep in their van. It's a true story. Those stories are the majority of the stories that people are homeless in LA. <coughs> they are people who have experienced trauma, people who are extremely poor, people who don't have any privilege, and now they're hiding. Jack, the, the man I was talking about earlier, I befriended him because he was a war veteran. At the time, if you remember, during the Iraq War, we had this thing called the Surge. Remember that? We sent a wave of people over there, supposedly, to like finish or fix the war. Except we know, statistically, every time you have a surge, when they come home, you have what's called a reverse surge. And we know that veterans who have seen inactive duty in active combat zones experience PTSD. 
and the VA here was way under-equipped to deal with PTSD, so we had a reverse surge, which created a reverse surge in veteran homelessness in LA. Jack had a girlfriend, he came home to her, he was completely traumatized by war, the VA was taking way too long to help him or do anything, and so she kicked him out, and he ended up living with a squad mate on the couch, and then another squad mate on the couch, but their girlfriends or wives kept kicking him out, and eventually he ended up on the street. And Jack used to walk to McDonald's, which is down the street, in a similar situation, the manager of the McDonald's had Rahmanis on him, and would give him a hash brown and a coffee every morning. And that's how he lived, until he was arrested and thrown out like trash. And that's why, you know, that's one of the reasons why I do what I do. He was Latino, by the way. Okay. And his name is not Jack, it's just what I use. So these are, those are the numbers. Um, let's talk about Torah for a minute. I have a whole text sheet that didn't get printed because our printers at BBS all blew up at the same time. But I have it online, and if you're interested, please, I'll be happy to send you. Um, I created an open source document on Safaria, also, called Jewish Response to Homelessness. It's 11 pages long already, and um, please add to it if you come across texts that deal with the homeless um, or deal with extreme poverty in our Jewish tradition. I'll give you just a few. The one that's obvious, of course, is because it's PowerPoint, the white ones didn't show up. I was trying to be nice and fun and cool and graphic. The, the, most, the most famous one is from Isaiah. We know from, from Yom Kippur, the Haftarah for Yom Kippur. This is, is this the fast that I desire? Right? What I love about that, that chapter 58 of Isaiah, the one that we read on Yom Kippur, is it really talks about someone who's poor as being fettered or chained and in the dark. And the people I know who experience homelessness feel that way. They feel chained to the street. They feel imprisoned. A woman, Sheila, who uh, has now become a Speak Up advocate, amazing woman, told me her story, public story, that she felt she was in solitary confinement in public. We have a word for that in Jewish tradition. We call that cher. That she was put in cher. Nobody would talk to her. No one would smile at her. They would ignore her as if she was a non-person simply because she was a black woman who was poor. And all she wanted was someone to smile and acknowledge her. She felt chained to her homelessness, chained to her poverty, chained to the street. And so, uh, on Yom Kippur afternoon, when we're davening and really into ourselves and thinking about how we break our own egos and all the things that we've committed, all the sins we've committed, Isaiah comes and said, is that what this is about? This is a joke. What God really wants for you is to get out of shul and to go fix this other problem. That's why I love Isaiah. Um, Deuteronomy, which is where the, this is the first text I preached on, and I'm happy to share that sermon with you that launched our homelessness task force, is from uh, the, book, the, the section we, we, that the Haggadah is based on, and also it's from the holiday of Shavuot. The landowner, the Israelite who has become settled in their land, and has a big harvest, has to put in a gilded basket all of the bikurim and bring it to the temple, right? And he ascends the temple mount, and he hands the bikurim to the priest. Now the text is very cool there, because what it says is the word that the priest uses to declare, the, to ask the question, is um, the priest says the word is va'anita, ayin nun he which we know means to answer. Right? That's the, that is the, it says uh, here, it says, when you say, my father was a wandering Aramean, or a homeless Aramean, or an Aramean tried to hunt down my father, depending on which drasha you use, the answering text, it says, the Anita, which means that there was a question that was asked. And the question, very simply, the priest asked the landowner is, who are you? And the answer was, not... I'm Noah, a landowner. The answer was, I come from nothing. We come from nothing. I come from, from this test of being homeless. And that each, inside each and every one of us, no matter how privileged we are, houses with mortgages, powerful friends and allies, Ivy League education, 
vacations once, twice, three times a year. No matter how privileged we are, the answer to the question that the priest asks us on Har Habayit is not that. The answer is, I began from nothing. And then I bring my privilege to the table and I've shared it with those who have not yet experienced privilege. That was the text that we used to the last the past words. We know from Psalm 146, Psalm 146 happens to be my favorite psalm because it's the social gospel. God, this is where the language of the giver wrote section of the Amidah comes from. God is the one who gives sight to the blind, clothes the naked, perverts the the strangers, the needs the orphan and the widow. What I love about this is that it's a psalm. We know from the Torah that you're supposed to look out for the orphan, the widow, and the child. The psalm, as much as we say that the Torah is written by God or by Moses, or in modern language, inspired by God, written by human beings, the psalm is so powerful <coughs> because it's a declaration of faith that God does do these things. But God does these things through us, through God's witness. And then there's just one last text I'm going to teach you, and then, and then maybe we open up for discussion of other texts you're thinking about. From Bayit So if a rich man says to the poor man, why do you not go to work and get food? Look at those hips, look at those legs, look at that fat body, look at those lumps of flesh. How many... Rich people do we know in America that blame poor people for being poor? Get a job. How often have you heard that? Get a job. You're lazy. I pulled myself up on my bootstraps. Why can't you? Look at that. You're just lazy and you're fat and you're misshapen. So the coach Shark who comes and says to the rich person, it's not enough that you haven't given him anything of yours to help him out. You must also mock what I've been able to give him, circumstances that he's found himself in. How could you? How could you be so cruel? How could you be so callous? I see. How could, yeah, go ahead. Isn't that also saying, like, that fat body, don't look, those aren't, I mean, those are okay qualities for him to have physically. Yeah. Your eye, I mean, obviously you can get carried away with this, but I, you, the person's saying that like, you look so bad and what you have, your, your body looks like you've been eating or something. That I are made you disgusting? that body, I you're, made that body. Yeah, you're but disgusting. But it's disgusting also because you're not out there using that body to get food or get money. One of the things that I've tried really hard when I work with the absolute most difficult people who haven't bathed in a long time is to try, as bad as it smells and as bad as it looks, to try to hide that. Oh, yeah. You, that yeah. You're, that and you're I try not to treat re repel them. That's yeah, right. That, and you fight that revulsion. Because yeah. it's, not, it's not them that I find revolting. It's what's happened to them. And you have to shift that that understanding that People who are homeless are victims. The number of intentional people who are intending to have a libertine existence and not be homeless, there are a few. I've met one, met several down in Venice especially. There's like a whole cluster of them. It's less than 1% of the homeless population. Less than... People who choose to be homeless because they want to live free. Right? It's less than 1%. I got news for you. I haven't met a single child who's experienced homelessness that chose to be homeless. And California is 49th in the country in child homelessness. We're aspiring to be 50 with the way this is going. 49th. And some who, who say they're, that they'd rather live that way are comparing it to a shelter or... Yeah. So, I mean, it's not comparing it to a home. Yeah, but exactly. Well, people. So there are. So that's another quite one other myth. Just to bring that up, is this idea of being what's called service averse. That means that someone comes to you and says, "Hey, I want to get you into a shelter tonight," and you say no. 
there are a large number of people who are service adverse. It's not because they're choosing to be homeless by culture or design. It's because they have been traumatized by social services in the past. And so we have found a way to punch through that. And it's not surprising. There's no shortcuts. It's through relationships. You create outreach teams, which we have done, and we have sent those out into the field. And someone who's service averse today, and service averse tomorrow, and service averse next week, in two weeks from now, after knowing their story, and knowing their names, and knowing the outreach team's names, and their stories, suddenly they begin to open, and they're ready for housing. The way I think about people who are homeless is that there are people who are ready for housing today and people who are not quite yet ready for housing. The, the most important example that I've personally experienced are LGBTQ youth who come out to their parents and are kicked out to the street. And when you try to reach out to them and say, we'll give you a home, they say, well, the only person I ever trusted betrayed me. Why would I believe you? And you have to work with them try very hard to keep them away from being addicted to drugs and try to give them a home. It takes time. It takes time. It's the hardest thing to do. But homelessness was a man-made or a human-made crisis, which means that we can fix it. Because if we created it, we can uncreate it. If it was, if we had uh, a massive earthquake, God forbid, and 60,000 people were displaced tomorrow, don't you think there would be FEMA trailers and you know, presidential proclamations and disasters? But because we created this problem and it's so slow moving, the response has been pretty technical until about two years ago. And we're only at the beginning. So uh, here are things you can do. And then maybe we can bring up some Torah and think about how you can approach this. Number one, you should become familiar with the website la-hop.org. LA Hop is a brand new portal, just launched about a month and a half ago. There are two parts to the portal. There are those, a portal for those who are experiencing homelessness, which by the way, plenty of homeless people have access to the internet. They have email addresses. Some of them even have cell phones. And then the second part of the portal are for people who are seeing people who are homeless and don't know what to do. It's a GPS-enabled app if you put it on your phone. If you don't want to put it on your phone, it's fine. You can just log in. You don't have to log in with a username or anything. And it, but it will ask you for your location, and it will ping the location. And then that location will go to the handheld device iPads that the outreach teams are holding. And it gets put in the queue, and they'll try to get there as soon as they can. If you are experiencing homelessness, they want to ask you more data information so that they know what kind of housing and they, that information is sent to the outreach team immediately. So you should become familiar with that. So when someone says, I see a homeless person on the street, I don't know what to do, la-hop.org, brand new portal that we just launched um, that, uh, that, that is able to actually answer that question. And it's faster than calling 211 or any of the county numbers. Because those numbers will punch you through a voicemail system, will take forever, you'll be on hold before you get a hold of someone. This is a form you can fill out that pushes directly to the outreach team in your area. Okay? Um, another one is uh, an organization called Safe Parking. Safe Parking is started by a friend of mine, Scott Sales, who's a me member at Leo Beck and is funded by Pat and Eric Cohen at Leo Beck. And their idea was to take parking lots of faith institutions and create safe zones where people who are experiencing homelessness in their cars can come and park at night. There is seed money available from the county and the city that, it, that will actually pay your organization to, uh, to host these folks. They'll bring porta potties and showers. They will pay for security. Um, so if you're able to engage in that and have your congregation engage in that, that's a great solution. Uh, bring speakers to your campus to raise awareness. You can bring me, and there's a hundred other people who are better at this than I am. Um, you can do what we did. We created a task force at our congregation that works on this issue and works on it from a direct service perspective, education perspective, and policy perspective. So that's how we created this coalition 
was that our policy folks on our task force went out and found a bunch of churches and turns out United Way was starting to work on this and then suddenly the Chamber of Commerce decided to get in on this because of the business-oriented development piece of this. And uh, it just created this wave and it created a very unlikely coalition. Um, but some of the bond measures language was actually <coughs> in our conference room at our center. Because we've been involved from the very, very beginning. So you can create your own task force. You can have them meet with our task force. We can give you all sorts of things to do. Um, and of course, you can always volunteer for the homelessness count. We find this is a great bridge activity that brings people who have not been involved into conversation. It's in January, the last week of January every year. Um, and it is the largest single volunteer project in all of LA County. 8,600 volunteers in one night, or over the course of three nights. And depending on where you live and what institution you're working through, those districts, the, those census tracts, either on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday night, it's completely free to do, completely free for your institution to host. And uh, it's a great way of involving people who don't quite know what to do yet. Essentially, you go to the synagogue or you go to the YMCA or whatever, you get a half hour orientation of what to do which is essentially they run you through the form, and then you jump in your car with three other people and you drive a road map of census tracts looking for homeless people picking it up. You don't actually engage with the homeless that night, it's really just a count. That information then is taken back and uh, through a contract with USC, we actually uh, we amalgamate all the information and that's how we come up with our statistics, which is so important because that's through federal funding. So the homelessness count is like mitzvah day for the homeless. Like it's like a great chance to like introduce people to all sorts of things that we do for the homeless. Um, you can also, through policy, support more interim and supportive housing in your local community. All the money from H and HHH has been collected for this year and is being allocated. And guess where it's being held up is at the neighborhood level because we want to build shelters. We want to build supportive housing units, and everyone thinks it's a good idea, just not in my backyard. And so you can galvanize your community to say yes in my backyard. Yeah. You're not using the mayor's language, like you're using interim and not bridge housing? Yeah. That's the one thing that can yeah. be a little confusing. Yeah, okay, so bridge housing and interim housing are essentially But you're basically thing. in the mayor's initiative. You're like, this is the same yeah. court, same... Yeah. More or less. I, I'd rephrase it differently. I would say the mayor's into your no, no, I, I get but that. whatever you no, know. I get that, um, um, the reason why I say that is because I'm a county commissioner. I was appointed by Sheila Kuehl, oh, and okay. I'm the chair of the of okay. the commission. So, so it's it goes beyond the city. So it's like yeah. I guess. So, but, 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 but interim is bridge. Yes. Being a chair of being chair of the commission is a little bit like being a synagogue president. Like I'm so happy I did it. I'm almost done, and I'll be so happy I did it. So it's like, I'm be very glad. Okay, so the, the Everyone In campaign is the United Ways campaign. You can definitely volunteer for that. Or you can volunteer at your local service agency um, doing direct service projects. So we have a partnership with LA Family Housing and with PATH, with the Hope of the Valley Rescue Mission. And you could bring food or do homework with kids who are homeless. Uh, questions, and then like this is kind of the end of like the downloading part, and then let's talk. Naomi, it's really like the statistics are statistics, but what you see with your eyes are totally different than sort of like the hopeful statistics that yeah. you're sharing. Yeah. And the fact that the time homeless are just such a small percentage when you live in a place like Venice or Santa Monica. Um, they are a large percentage. And I guess, you know, like, Nashuba's been involved with PATH, we're, we're involved with Upper Bound House, we're involved with the VA, we're involved in Venice with Safe Place for You, mm -hmm. and these things, but you just kind of feel like, you know, what's the good news, what's the bad news? And the bad news is that, from what we can see with our eyeballs, PATH's getting much worse. Much worse. Much worse. Um, the numbers of people that you see, like in, in front of the supermarket or all over the beach, and it's just like, bam, you know what they do? They round all the homeless up on Friday, 
and move them off for a few hours, and they, they come right back. And, um, and the tent city that, that Venice has become uh, is it's upsetting, and then the outreach groups that, you know, the out, whatever group, I don't remember the proper name, the outreach network. Yeah, outreach, outreach, yeah. You know, you can call, I mean, synagogues, churches, schools can call for two years and not get any, any results at all. So, I guess that's my question, is what happens, I mean, we can talk about pretty numbers, but when you look with your eyes, it's not that it's worse. Mm -hmm. It's worse for sure. A lot worse. So how do we? So that's a great and sort how of. How do you get somebody help when you you know obviously the police laugh when you try to talk to police about getting somebody help, but when you call these numbers and you call persistently and you get your neighbors, your synagogue, your church, and all the schools to make the same calls and nothing happens, then you just kind of feel like, well, there's a problem. Yeah. So I guess I'm, I'm not here just to defend the system because I think the system is not great, although getting better daily. Um, I think that, uh, that this problem that we're seeing, let's say the, the deepening problem that you're seeing, that we're seeing, is the result of decades of, of neglect on the social infrastructure of our county, and it's going to take a decade or more to fix it. In 2008, at the height of the Great Recession, 2009, the state, the federal government, the county, and the city all ate up all of the redevelopment money to cover the budget. We still have not recovered dollar for dollar the amount of money that went into redevelopment before 2008. And then we had 10 years where we didn't build a single thing for redevelopment. And we have a net in population of almost 100,000 people a year into LA County. So you add more people, you don't add housing over a decade, you're now in this crisis. And it's going to take a decade to get out of this crisis. I guess in terms of preaching, you have to choose which story you want to preach. Do you want to preach the story that nothing is happening and it's getting worse? Or do you want to preach the story that as bad as it looks, there is a world beyond what we can see that is trying very hard to build the machine that's going to fix this problem? I think there's a big difference between skepticism and cynicism. Skepticism is healthy. It's important for draining away the sort of uh, self-aggrandizement of the world. Cynicism, I think, can be toxic. And it can be an argument for throwing up your hands and saying, don't get involved because it's not worth it. So in terms of engaging the community, I think you have to, you, me, everyone, have to ask the question, what is the direction you want to draw this community? Part of it is also being left. Just feeling like people make a lot of campaign promises, but they don't make it their number one priority. And it's interesting because Mike Bonin has done a pretty good job. I'm mean, not to get into specifics, but yeah. of all of the units allocated for supportive housing in the next year, uh, Mike Bonin has allocated the most. Mm. My uh, congressperson Paul Koritz, the one next to me, uh, Blumenfeld, and the one next to me, the other side, David Brew. Between the three of them, you know how many they've allocated so far? Zero. Mm -hmm. Zero. Mike Bonin is something like 221. Wow. Which is not a ton, but it's 221 more than anyone else. So there is a lot of work to be done. And we have to hold them accountable. And we have to fight for it if we want to. There was a, you know that little Hasidic story about the boy of Sodom? You ever hear this story? <laughs> There's this boy in, in Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, yelling and screaming about the, uh, the impending doom. And no one was listening to him. And someone walked by and said, well, why are you yelling and screaming? 
you know that you know nothing's going to change. And the boy says, I'm not screaming for you, I'm screaming for me. And for me, I think that's part of it, is that I don't want to feel complicit in a conversation that says there's nothing to be done. And I want to be part of a solution. And I want to hold people accountable. And I want to throw people out of office or get people impeached or whatever it is in order to make this moral problem, you know, address this moral problem. So that's, that's how I approach it. Yeah. What strategies for fixing the town successful to overcome the not in my backyard here or elsewhere? Yeah. We have statistics, I have statistics collected that supportive housing apartment units don't uh, deplete land values. In fact, many of them are the nicest apartments on the block because they're the newest. And uh, they also, homeless people don't hang out in front of supportive housing units because they don't need to, because they could just go inside. So they actually, the number of people who are on the street kind of loitering goes down around those units because they have places to go. Um, we also engage people sort of face-to-face, one-on-one. We have a number of real estate folks in our congregation, it's probably not a surprise, and we talk with them face-to-face. And some of them are so far to the right on every issue, but because I have a relationship with them, I say, no, no, not this, these are people. So we're looking for sites in Encino for shelter and for the bridge housing shelter and for support housing. And we have a couple of sites coming up, I think at the end, in October or November, they'll be public. And we're going to be trying to build support housing. Most of, most of the reason why folks don't want the homeless around them is because they don't understand the homeless. And there's all sorts of, like to say the homeless, of course, as I said before, is very broad, but these are, these are human beings. Uh, the images with the, the one third of, you, of the pictures, yeah. that's the image that you have. Right. Aside from using your shrubs or property for their toilet facilities and increased crime and vandalism, right. so if all of those things are myths, then how do you. Well, they're, they're not the myths in the sense. Them. The myth is that they're, that they're the entire population. Because they exist, we know that they exist, and not every person is a good person. And we have, there is a law enforcement solution to people who are not good people. That is true. But a law enforcement solution shouldn't be the only solution for trying to solve this crisis. And we know that because the, in New York, for example, dollar for dollar from their budget that they spend on homelessness versus what they spend on law enforcement for homelessness far exceeds what ours is. Ours is reversed. Currently, we spend more money on LAPD for homelessness than we do on social services for homelessness. And that's got to shift. Because, we're, again, we're trying to, to cure the disease, not the symptoms of the disease. So, again, like, I think that's, that's part of it, too. The strategies that work for us are about engaging. I don't think there's shortcuts. I don't think you can just put out a postcard and say, I fulfilled my obligation and the strategy. Postcard is like the easiest thing to do. You have to pick up the phone, you have to knock on doors, you have to do deep canvassing with people. And then you, when they have a, a neighborhood council meeting or a homeowners association meeting, if your people care about this issue, they need to show up. And they need to show up and they need to flood the meeting. And you say, yes, in my backyard, this is what we want. This is what we voted for, right? For a hundred years, we cared about the homeless, but we also cared about them far away. We put them in a place that became known as Skid Row. We decided to put all the social services for people who are homeless in one neighborhood, which has destroyed that neighborhood and has also become insufficient in helping the homeless. The homeless problem on Skid Row is almost a nation unto itself. And so the future has to be scattersight. Because you can't concentrate all of that in one place because it creates a quality of life that's so terrible for everyone who's down there, no matter what part of the economic spectrum you're on. So we have to create scatter site, allow people to uh, become homeless in their own neighborhood, experience homelessness for hopefully the shortest amount of time possible, and then find a home in their neighborhood. 
That's the goal. Well, our goal for, for ending homelessness is not to eliminate homelessness altogether, because you can't do that. But our goal is to eliminate, uh, to, to severely reduce the time someone is homeless, the number of people who fall into homelessness, and the severity of their homeless condition. Most people who are homeless today are homeless for 90 days around. And the problem is they're completely unsheltered during that time. So if we can get someone to be homeless for seven days and be sheltered during that time, that's a society that says we take care of everyone. Even people who are going to fall through the cracks because that's going to happen. Because there will always be the needy amongst us. We know that from the Torah. But our response to that is what counts. Not the fact of it, but the response to it. Um, has anyone ever preached on this in their synagogue or their community? Any things that have worked for you or have been, you found inspiring yourself? Stories maybe you want to share out so that we can use some personal stories in our talking about this on the holiday. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I don't really know where to begin. I'm sort of new to this issue. I'm, I'm in Malibu. There's a lot of homeless there. Our, our synagogue was involved with the church group, we would go one night a week and we would pick in the church and the homes would go there and then the city shut it down about six months ago and the church heard it and said, all right, we'll feed people on the beach. We started doing that. That whole episode of Not My Backyard, though, led to a, um, a community-wide task force that is now, now the city provides meetings. We have a lot of members in the city that are involved, and October 20th, we're showing a film about homelessness that some of the community made, and we're going to really take on the issue for the year. So I really have no idea what we should be doing. Um, in terms of preaching and stories, one is that story. It's Another good. story is uh, the story of the film that we're showing, which is Guy, the a movie producer, he heard about this woman who was a singer at an event, and it turns out the singer was tracing her roots and discovered that she'd been adopted by a Jewish family and discovered her father was a homeless guy and she brought him back and they were coming to they perform together now. She had rescued him. So anyways, we're showing that Then we also have we have a guy who lives somewhere on the beach and has services. More here than anyone else in the show besides me. So I, mean, I just don't really know what we should, like people want it. Then I have other people, like, well, we have buildings downtown and uh, it's negatively impacting our property. But, you know, I give dollars a year to some shelter. Or, I don't even know what they give to. Mm -hmm. and that's their solution. Really, but aside from not knowing really what position I should be taking, what I should be doing, other than going to be engaging, um, I also hear like lots of plans that people are involved in. One is, oh, we think great in the six percent of people we bust them out to where they came from. That's a good thing. Sounds like uh, to deport them. Maybe it's a good thing. I don't know your opinion on that. Um, I think people have liberty. Like, that's what's great about liberty, is that you can't actually just round people up and deport them. I mean, supposedly, anyway. Uh, and I don't think you can say, as a community, as they did in the 80s, that people who are mentally unstable have the liberty to suffer on the streets and not be under conservatorship of the state. That we also then have the liberty of people who've chosen to make their life in Los Angeles and say you can't live here and deport them. Like, you, you can't have both. Either it's liberty or no liberty. So, uh... So, yeah, that's not a solution. Yeah. What, if it's, what if it is moving them to a place that is a little less expensive than... That's a great idea, but let me tell you something. Hawaii was indicted a number of years ago for this exact problem. They would take people who are homeless in Hawaii, put them on a plane to Los Angeles, and hold them in a six-week addiction counseling in-residency unit. But it was a one-way ticket, so they would end up... Uh, coming out of this addiction counseling center, which is sober, with enough money for a bus ticket, but not enough money to get back to Hawaii. And there's no road long enough that you could build to Hawaii. So, 
they were indicted because of that, and they, the, the solution is they have to build addiction counseling centers in Hawaii. Like, you can't do it. So people need to can be who they want to be. Freedom of movement is one of the sacred freedoms of being in America. Last time I checked, we don't get our papers checked every time we enter or leave a county or enter a new state. Like, maybe your produce. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I also think that as rabbis, our job is to show the moral angle of this problem and not just the political angle of this problem. These are human beings. And if you want to bless your own kids on Friday night with the blessings of the priests and the blessing of the ancients, why would you not then imbue every human being who has been created in the image of God with that same sense of unique, special divinity? And if that's the case, then when someone is suffering on the street, as Vayika Rabbah teaches us, how could you be so cruel to the image of God? Sure. It's what's saying. The advocates are saying, no, that's an absolute act. Humans were from. If they want that, and you give them the tools, and you can give them the tools for sustainable economic development of their family. Reunification is another issue which I didn't even bring up, which has to do with foster care. Okay. Sixty percent of men who are incarcerated in LA County, of black men especially, and sixty percent of them have exited the foster care system. There is an entire group of homeless called transition age youth, which is eighteen to twenty-five year olds, who on their eighteenth birthday their foster mother or father kicked them out of the house because they're not getting a check anymore. Reunifying them with their biological parents is part of the system. Sometimes that means they're out of state. Sometimes that means they're out of county. Whatever. Right? That's a good thing. But for those, again, who don't have privilege, don't have a father or a mother or a brother or a sister or uncle who can take care of them, if they don't have that, that buffer, they end up suffering. And they can either go to jail or they can end up on the street. And so I think that, that uh, reunification is part of this process. Um, and maybe that is where you can send someone along their way. But I don't think that, that, that you know, they are still free. They're free human beings. And they have to choose to take that. And you can't manipulate the choice where it's like, like I do with my kids. Do you want to have dinner before your bath or dinner after your bath? You can't like close in the choice. They have to be able to choose where they want to live. And again, as a rabbi... Our job is to show the moral dimension. And what our tradition teaches so eminently clearly, from not just the little text, but from everywhere in our tradition, that we have to help them. When a beggar comes door to door, says the Mishnah, you have to provide them with food. An indigent, traveling, homeless person has to be provided. You can inspect them. You can actually ask them what they need, and if they're telling you the truth, <coughs> you can do that. When it comes to if they want clothing or they want you know, a pot or a pan or something. But if they want food, according to the Mishnah and the Mishnah Torah, Rambam, you're not allowed to ask them a single thing. If somebody wants food, you give them food. Period. Because it's about the dignity of human life. Um, the, the easy way of saying, what do you do when you encounter someone who's homeless on the street? You can go to LAHop.org. Um, the truth is, you don't have to engage with them if you don't feel safe. Especially as women. If you're walking at night and a homeless person asks for a, a dollar or two or whatever, you don't have to engage them. There's no law saying you're Jewish law, you have to engage them. But if you choose to engage them, you have to engage them as a human being. You should smile. You should look them in the eye. If you, if you don't want to give them anything, money or anything, you don't have to. But you have to be honest about that. Say, you know, I, just not today. But have a great day. If you choose to give them money, this is really cool halakhic law. If you choose to give them money, let's say you want to give them $5. The $5 that's in your pocket that you've already chosen to give them no longer belongs to you, even if it's still in your pocket. Mm -hmm. It belongs to them. Which means you can't judge them for what they use the money for. Because it's their money. So if, someone, if you think that they're going to go and use it on liquor or heroin or something, um, you, you can't judge them on that. Because you're going to give them the money. They can do with it whatever they want. You can't hold this money over them and say, I'm only going to give it to you if, if you go buy a sandwich and not go buy a bottle. 
Because maybe a bump is what they need to get the demons out of their head in order to make it through the night. So we're not allowed to govern money in that way with the homeless. Most importantly, though, is if you want to have it, if you have the time, have the conversation. Break them out of their solitary confinement. End the chayyim. Let them feel like they're a human being. And if you see that they're suffering, like mom is suffering, like they're sick, you actually have an obligation to connect them to medical services. If you see a homeless person that's passed out, not sleeping, but like passed out, or is bleeding, you have to call 911. You would call 911 if they were uh, dressed in a you know, Prada suit and they fell down on the street and they're passed out. Why wouldn't you call 911 if they're homeless? That's our moral obligation. And then if you want to go upstream, you can work on all the campaign stuff I'm talking about. So, I mean, I can hammer it, I can yell. I, when I'm on the pulpit, I'm much louder and much broader. But in this group, I think we just talk very simply about it. It's a hard issue. It is a moral crisis. But it's eminently solvable. Any insights of the Parker Center? I think Parker Center should be renamed. I don't think you need to tear it down. Unless there's like some kind of physical... Is anyone what Parker Center is? Parker Center is the old LAPD headquarters. It's named after this notorious police chief um, that was incredibly racist and vicious. I think you can... You don't have to tear it down. I don't think that that's really worth it, nor do I think even in Jewish life, the way that we fix tuma is not to blow something up, but to re-sanctify it. And I think that you change the name and you re-sanctify it to something different than it is, which is, which is one of the reasons why I'm thinking of putting the people, letting the people reside there are the very victims of Parker's reign as chief of police. So I think that that would be a good tikkun in my and by the way, the LA Times building, which is just around the corner, is also empty. The old LA Times building. It's a great building. That's a great building to, re- to remodel. There was a piece on the radio this morning about Veterans Administration housing. I didn't have a chance to hear it. What did they say? Well, just how slow it's going. It's terrible. Because people were charged with crimes for what they were doing with the money. But, yeah. um, but there's 54 people living there now. Here in LA, or yeah, yeah. You mean the big VA, yeah, too. The Brentwood VA. Yeah. But they are doing. Um, like we're about now with feeding the ones living in their cars there. But it's just like such a little nothing. Yeah. It's. I think we're. They allow now. I think there's ten cars. It's so sad. Ten cars. It's so sad because the so reason why the VA exists is, is to help people, right. which is why we are involved in the. Um, Sorry, five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it was why we were involved in the lawsuit against them, which indicted them for graft and for embezzlement and uh, an injunction against them because they were renting the property to UCLA. They were renting the property to Marriott, to other organi- other to businesses, school. to schools, to and they were getting tons of money, but they weren't actually helping the VAs. And by the way, the, the, the Marriott's my favorite case because it was an industrial laundry. You know, all the towels and linens you get in, right? they all drive them there, wash them, and send them out. Guess who was employed? Not a single veteran was employed at the VA, at the industrial laundry, at the VA to help Marriott. Not a single one. So they were indus- indicted a number of years ago. And they have to, and guess how many of the barracks were being used to house veterans? Zero. They were all mothballed. So. They're under injunction to do it, so which is why I'm glad they they keep bringing it up because they have to do it. Fifty-four people in a land mass that could house probably four thousand people. We could end veteran homelessness tomorrow if they built townhomes on that property and rented them at below market rate to veterans who are experiencing low income or homelessness with programs to hopefully get them on their feet, right? We could, we could end all veteran homelessness tomorrow if we were able to build a couple of blocks of townhomes. Yeah, they like the green open spaces. And, you know. Are there any public or private things that are really, like taking the LA Times building and really 
building? Well, so Parker Center is, what, uh, is the most famous one. That's kind of up in a fight because there's a lot of people who just want to tear the building down. And because they associate it so negatively, right? Their sense of metaphysical trauma around that is to tear it down, which I understand. I just think that that's a slower model. The tearing down and rebuilding from scratch is so much slower and more costly than just gutting the offices and turning them into units. But if people want to, to give towards that, is there, to whom to give them to take down the Yeah, so uh, if you have people who are especially significant givers, there's a funders collaborative for the United Way. They're amazing. So like your real estate folks, for example. The funders collaborate, they try to create the funds to help do these kinds of projects. So look through the United Way and email me afterwards if you have a hard time finding it and I'll make a shit off with you with the actual officers at United Way because they're my buddies. So for me, for five years I've been working on this issue. I've become kind of known as like the homelessness rabbi. It was never my intention. I'm a social justice rabbi, not a homelessness rabbi, but I'm okay. I feel okay with it because I'd rather work on one issue and know that I've completely moved the ball than work on a hundred issues and just kind of done band-aids. And this, and this, this issue, is, is, it's possible to fix it. And it's not political, even though it involves politics. And it's not just economic, it's moral. Absolutely moral. And if every Angelino was able to do one positive thing for a homeless person tomorrow, would go a long way to solving this crisis. And I think the themes of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur mesh very nicely with this moral problem. Because it's not just about the sins of, of commission, it's about the sins of omission. It's not just about seeing the surface of a human being, but see, looking deeply into their souls and understanding that, that there is a secret that each one of us carry, and most of those secrets have to do with shame, and we have to expose and shine light on shame, and on the shame of people who are experiencing homelessness. And that it's possible to make tshuva not just between two human beings, but between, for a whole society. And I think tshuva is possible in this case. And we already know that we've gone a long way. We, we passed two historic, very historic measures tax ourselves twice on this. And now we just have to get to the finish line. Mm -hmm. And it takes everyone. Everyone needs to be part of it. That's why it's called Everyone Ends, because we need everyone in. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm happy to talk more about it. I'm happy to talk with you individually about it. I do have this amazing source sheet that I've started on Safari, which is called the Jewish Response to Homelessness. And they're not in any particular order. I haven't really like indexed them, but if you find a text, if you ever use Safari, which is a wonderful textual database, and you find something that says, oh, that sounds interesting, add the text to the, add the text. Mm -hmm. We'll create a whole Bible worth of stuff. And the texts that I focus on aren't necessarily explicitly about homelessness, but it's about the extreme poor, it's about dignity, about tzedakah, about fighting for justice. So let, let's think about that. Yeah, please, Michael. Uh, I feel like I distracted this before, but it jumps in the text. And one thing I'm thinking of Mason teaches this thing, I can't remember exactly where it was, but it's from this group in Israel called the Mizrach Shemesh. And the basic point is, who is someone who's wealthy? It's someone who has more than me. So what is, what is being rich? It means that the portion in this world of other people is deposited with that wealthy person's pocket, and their responsibility is to make sure that it's distributed yeah. to them. Uh, downside of that teaching is. So then who are the people who are looking at someone who's not righteous enough and they're they gotta go find their portion, right? But this idea I think is really resonating with people in our city of life of more than what you need is not really yours. It's sort of like your idea of five bucks in the pocket, right? It's really belonging to these other people. Your job is to ensure that they're getting it. Yeah. As one rich person told me, I have a pair of jeans for every day of the week. Why do I need to buy another pair? He's one of the biggest philanthropists, and he, he wears, like, fancy jeans and jackets and stuff, right? He's like, how many more pairs of blue jeans can I possibly own? So he uses his wealth to try to help, help those who are much less fortunate. You should also know that in the Talmud, I mean, I could have taught this very much through legal text, but in the Talmud, it's very clear that the government has a responsibility. And by the government, 
I mean the corporate body of the Beit Din and the Sanhedrin has a responsibility to take care of the Jewish poor and the non-Jewish poor. We don't have that system today, but we still have a government. And so for those of us, those of who may be in your congregations or in your communities who say it's not the government's job, it's churches or synagogues or uh, uh, just private foundations' job, you say, well, that's actually, that's not the Jewish view. The Jewish view, it is the corporate body of the community's responsibility, which the corporate body of this community is our government. And it's our government's responsibility because no church, no foundation can possibly do the kind of work that the government can do to, for social redistribution in order to end extreme poverty and homelessness. And so that is, it's very clear. Mishnah Sanhedrin is all about that. Mishnah Mako is all about that. It's a corporate body of the community's responsibility to adjust, uh, adjust the whim of society so that people are not free to suffer, but they're free to prosper. So that's a that's how I. That's how I look at it. You had a question. Uh, I, I'm tongue tied. I worked for the board of rabbis as the rabbi serving in the jails until that was moved into the Jewish Federation last year, and then they dropped the grant. There is no Jewish chaplaincy other than Orthodox in Los Angeles County. I'm so upset about it. I can, can't even. Speak. Um, and I am in the process of trying to create a nonprofit, finding uh, an umbrella that would like there to be Jewish chaplains in Los Angeles, serving these people who cycle through the jails. I see them over and over. They are transgender. They are abused. They are homeless, addicted. Beautiful souls that just want to hear some Jewish Judaism. And I'm doing it as a volunteer right now. Any ideas would be appreciated. Thank you. I think, uh, oh, let's talk because I think a Jewish Community Foundation grant might not be started. I was just there. I was just, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Shana Tova.